Welcome back to the Podium Performance Podcast, where we talk about physical performance. I'm your host, Coach Tony. You can find this podcast on YouTube or on Apple and Spotify Podcasts. Today, I'm going to be talking about the various characteristics of athleticism. Another way we can look at this is, what are the physical traits that we looked at to determine how athletic a person is? Now, as a preface to all of this, different sports or physical domains are going to have varying degrees of these to have peak performance in a specific domain. So what are these basic fundamental physical traits that we use to determine physical performance or athleticism? They are strength, speed, stamina and work capacity, range of motion and or flexibility, size, yes, this actually matters for different physical domains, which we will cover in the future, and finally, coordination. So now that I've given the six primary traits of athleticism, I need to explain to you each of them a bit more in depth. Each of these will have its own episode or episodes because of how wide reaching they are from how to develop each methods and uses, as well as what they actually encompass for performance. But for this episode, I'm going to be, for the most part, giving an outline of each of these. Each trait is on a continuum. Maximum athleticism for a sport or a task is finding the optimal balance between these for the job at hand. So let's start off with physical physical strength. To put it as dumbly as possible, strength is simply lifting weights, fighting gravity with as much load as possible, or is the ability to create force. Now, to go a bit deeper into what strength is, it is how much weight you can lift for a given number of repetitions or amount of time. It's also overcoming external resistance, like another person trying to overpower you in a collision or combative situation, whether that's in sport or in actual physical combat and conflict. Now, we have all heard of superhuman feats of strength from people in a life and death situation with adrenaline pumping, such as a mother lifting a car off their child. This is referred to as limit strength. It is literally the absolute limit that a person can lift. While we can't directly train this because of the emotional and situational requirements to bring it out, it is often accompanied by some form of injury. Whenever you go to the absolute breaking point and limit, the risk for injury skyrockets, such as in these cases. Since you are listening to this, you probably already know that we can train strength and get stronger. This is where the traditional gym comes in, but we can also train strength in other non-traditional ways, like by doing combat type sports like wrestling and grappling, by doing physical labor and construction tasks, or just dragging around heavy stuff. These will not just help develop strength, but also develop specific strength for those tasks Just like doing squats will make your legs stronger and make you better at squat type exercises. There are other underlying strengths such as absolute strength, which is the most weight you can voluntarily lift for a set number of reps, relative strength, which is how strong you are in relation to your body weight. A simple task, a simple test of this is, can you do a chin up, a push up, a dip? Now, how many of them can you do? Can you add weight to these? Another way to see relative strength is what is your one repetition maximum on a specific lift in comparison to what is your body weight. One lifting variable that can quickly influence how many repetitions you can do with an amount of weight is the tempo or the speed of the lift, also known as time under tension. The longer a rep is, or if there are pauses, this will heavily influence how much you can lift or how many times you can lift that weight. The amount of rest that you take between sets, exercises, or even training sessions can and will influence your strength in a session. A popular strength test that is used in sport is a 225 pound bench press test at the NFL Combine where the attendees do as many repetitions as possible with 225 pounds. Other ways to measure, other ways to measure strength is by using force plates or rep maximum testing. Whether this is one repetition, five, 10 repetitions, or even 20 repetition maximum tests. There's also three different main contraction strengths to remember. You have concentric strength, or the amount that you can actually lift up against gravity. There's isometric strength, which is 
keeping the weight in a single spot without it going up or down. So the muscle isn't stretching or shortening. And then there is eccentric strength, which is where you are actually the strongest and it is how much weight you can control while the muscle is lengthening. So how much you can control, for example, on a squat while going down with the weight. You're not necessarily going to be able to come back up with it, but how much can you control on the negative portion? The second trait of athleticism, speed might be the easiest of these to actually explain. It is simply how fast you do something or how fast something moves. It's literally that simple. The difference of thousands of a second in some sports is the difference between millions of dollars in prize money or getting a new paycheck. Whether it's movement speed or throwing kicking speed, it is all about how fast things are moving. In the sporting world, it is either all about the time on the clock or what comes up on the radar gun. In a tactical environment, it could be how fast you can get to cover or throw that first punch. So to put it simply, speed is again, how fast something moves or that you do something. Famous examples of this are the 100 meter dash, the 40 yard dash, 500 meter long track speed skating, or the service speed or pitching speed in sports like tennis and baseball. One description we hear a lot in the world of sport is that athlete is powerful. But what does that really mean? A lot of times we hear this in terms of punching power or for acceleration and jumping ability. Now think about each of these situations. They all require the second term I just mentioned, acceleration. So really what power is in these situations really means is that how well or how quickly you can increase your speed from zero. So really power is actually an aspect of speed, but it's also combined with strength. Personally, because it has to do with acceleration, I have it as a hybrid of speed and strength, but I file it in the speed category primarily. <coughs> this will be explained in a later episode when I cover power much more in depth. While some people are born gifted with speed in various tasks and make millions, it is actually quite trainable between proper training, strength, and maturation. Now, while I've primarily spoken about speed at the high end of things, speed also has to do with how quickly you can do a task that is longer in duration, such as distance running, marathoning, or cycling, and even swimming. Keep in mind that the greater the distance, you will not be able to maintain the same high speeds due to the due to the greater intensity levels required for moving faster. Agility would also fall into the category of speed. The reason for this is that agility is another form of acceleration. How well you can change direction to simplify it. So you must first slow down in one direction and then move in another direction. The absolute best examples of this are when you see somebody moving up the field, juke to one side and then go, be going the other direction with minimal loss of speed or when you see somebody running forward fast, stop and turn on a dime and go a completely different direction, whether it's 90 degrees or doing a complete 180 to go back the direction they were coming and doing this in the shortest amount of time possible. Our third trait of athleticism is stamina or work capacity. And this is how long you are able to do the task at hand. There are different ways of measuring this, but the easiest and cheapest way at what point do you get tired? Is this perfect? No, but it's very easy to measure. An example would be how many stairs can you climb before you have to slow down? Then how many before you have to actually stop? So there are a few different ways to look at this. It's how long can you maintain a set intensity and also how long you can go before failure. Now I will state that it is quite specific and I'll explain that a little bit better now. One of the gold standard tests of stamina is the VO2 max or the volume of oxygen you can, hand, you can utilize. The higher this number, typically the higher your work capacity for aerobic activity. For aerobic activity, lactate testing is done. Now, most people don't have access to these because the testing for them are, is quite cost prohibitive. It, and it's typically done in a lab setting. Just think, in order to do VO2 testing, you actually need to have a MOXIS or some form of respiratory exchange ratio uh, measure to be going on. 
One, you have to be able to measure how much oxygen is going into you and then how much you're going to be ex uh, exhaling out. And from this, we can tell how much oxygen your body is using. Something to keep in mind for stamina and work capacity is that it is still going to be highly specific. But what do I mean by this? A runner, for example, is going to have better work capacity at running than a biathlete. An infantryman is going to be, have a better work capacity for a ruck march than a surgeon is. A strongman competitor will have greater work capacity dragging a truck than a bodybuilder. Stamina might just be the single most trainable aspect of athleticism. It is also, in all honesty, one of the most important, not just in many sports, but in life in general for survivability. My reason for saying this is because work stamina will also have a massive impact on injury resilience and this will be discussed as well in future episodes. In the weight room, one way to measure the work capacity of a person is how well they recover between sets and workouts. A person with a better fitness level will recover better and need less rest to maintain the same number of repetitions with the same weight. So we can measure an improvement here in a few different ways. We can increase the number of total repetitions in the workout. We can have less of a drop off in the number of reps from set to set. We can do more sets or we can do the same performance with less rest. This can also be done for track workouts, for example. Can you do another run repetition or can we decrease the rest in between runs? And then a huge factor is how well can and do you recover between training sessions? To have an improvement, you need to be able to improve upon reducing the time between sessions or increasing the volume. And if we're increasing intensity, being able to do more work. This is how work capacity is measured simply. Those who can recover better have better work capacity, while those who can't recover run the risk of exhaustion, overtraining, and injury. Our fourth trait of athleticism is range of motion and flexibility. This is fairly straightforward. It is how much mobility your joints have and how much flexibility your muscles have. One thing to keep in mind is stability has to do with the joint. Flexibility has to do with the muscle and tendon. Many times a person lacks range of motion or mobility because they do not have joint stability at that range. Stability is a factor of strength in that range. If you lack it, you won't be stable and then your body will protect itself by trying to prevent you from getting into that range. Now the difference between range of motion, so sorry, in a squat, a person can have a fairly average flexibility or even poor flexibility, but they can still manage to get the full range of motion in a squat because the muscles might not have to lengthen all that much to get there, but the joints need to go through a greater range of motion. So despite being inflexible, some people can still do a full squat, for example. Range of motion is going to be influenced by flexibility, the ability for the muscle or tendon to, to stretch. And yes, at, the, at a natural level, women are going to be more flexible than men, but it is still a highly trainable trait. Extreme examples of range of motion and flexibility will be your Olympic caliber gymnasts and contortionist artists. Just think, somebody having to fold themselves and bend to get through a coat hanger is going to be fairly flexible with lots of range of motion. While on the other side of the spectrum are going to be people who are stiffer than a board or people who suffer from stiff person syndrome. One thing we need to differentiate is that what we mostly look at at here in terms of flexibility is static flexibility and range of motion, like the bend over and touch your toes or touch the middle of your back. The other side of the spectrum for this is dynamic range of motion and flexibility where things are done at varying speeds. So you're in motion for this. There are people who are much more flexible and much more flexible dynamically than they are statically. One reason for this is natural tightness due to muscles and tendons, elasticity of stiffness, or even from scar tissue. A lot of sporting movements require dynamic flexibility and range of motion at high velocities. Take pitching a fastball in baseball, for example. While yes, the pitcher will have excellent range of motion in the shoulder to allow it, they are still able to make their arm work like a whip to 
maximize the speed that they're throwing. Our fifth trait of athleticism, one that some might view as controversial as a trait, but in my eyes, it still is a massive one, is size. Now, I'm not strictly talking about body size here. I'm talking about limb lengths, body proportions, body composition, muscle mass, all in terms of size. A taller, heavier person is not going to be able to accelerate or turn as quickly as a shorter person, but odds are they will be stronger and can be more explosive in a strength type dy dynamic. Think of an NFL lineman here or a strongman competitor, or even a shot putter. A larger tactical operator will be able to carry a, a heavier load for longer or have an easier time opening the door than, some, than a smaller operator will. They're gonna have more mass behind them when they hit that door to open it. Kind of like a Peterbilt tractor trailer, trailer can haul more than a Ford F-150. So size will influence athleticism in different ways. Limb lengths are also gonna play a role in different ways. A runner wants to have longer legs, while a swimmer wants shorter legs but longer arms. Take a look at MLB legend Randy Johnson. He's six foot 10, or about two meters 10 in height, and threw probably the most effortless 100 mile an hour fastball that I've ever seen, while be without being all that heavily muscled. Now take a look at Rocket Roger Clemens. He was much more heavily muscled. He still threw 100 miles an hour, but it looked much more required. Sorry, it looked like it needed more effort from him. Now compare that to these guys to Michael Phelps, for example. Michael Phelps is going to be shorter legged, extremely long arms. This is, helps to ha make him more optimal in the pool. Now all of these guys are absolute legends in their sports, and they are a bit of an outlier. But the traits that make them great also filter down to others in their sports. Now we can also look at a football lineman for this. Massive humans who can also explode off the line and do it again a minute later. But they're not gonna be able to have the same speed as a smaller person. Size is also going to include a person's body composition or body fat percentage. Since fat doesn't do anything active for you other than add weight to the body in the storage of energy, it doesn't help you move, but it can help you not be moved. It will impact speed negatively. Something to keep in mind here as well is that a larger human at the same body composition as a smaller human will carry more fat regardless since it's a percentage of the body weight, but that also means they're gonna carry more muscle and weight overall. This is one of the reasons for weight class sports, particularly in combat sports. And our final trait of athleticism, coordination. This one is huge because it's gonna determine whether or not a lot of people are a professional or not. It's, this is where skill comes in. Now many think coordination is just being able to get your hand to go where you are looking type of thing, but coordination is the basis of skill, speed, st and strength. I say this because coordination at the end of the day is your brain making your muscles contract precisely the way that you want them to and that are required for the task. Whether it's in the form of escaping from a rear naked choke or it's being able to put that baseball right where you want it. This comes in the form of gross motor skills like a jump, a sprint, or a throw but it's also the fine motor skills, as I was saying before, being able to get that baseball to curve the way you want from 12 o'clock to six o'clock at the right time requires fine motor skills and coordination. Or in MMA and kickboxing, it's landing that question mark kick. Right, instead of you hitting to the body, all of a sudden your leg snaps up and cracks your opponent in the side of the head. It is also gonna influence the firing pattern of muscles to optimize how fast you can run or the accuracy, for example, of a sniper's bullet shot. Your ability to balance just when walking is all about hundreds of muscles being contracting and relaxing in a specific pattern, order, and magnitude and precision to have your legs move while keeping you upright without falling over to the side, backwards, or on your face. Peak athleticism for a task is going to be very specific. Some tasks need more strength, 
while others might need more speed or work capacity, some might require you being larger or smaller to have the best performance. So to review, the major characteristics of athleticism are strength, speed, stamina, range of motion and flexibility, size, and coordination. These are on a continuum and their interrelationship with one another and are sport, position, or even job specific in order to maximize performance. Thank you for listening. You can find me at, at Wrestling Performance on Instagram and at wrestlingperformance.ca. Remember to subscribe and thank you for listening to the Podium Performance Podcast.